Um, so uh, Ryan was explaining what I do. I, I, I run a virtual business school. This is one of my classrooms. Um, I, that means I have a very strange life because I look like one person, but I'm actually two people. Um, and as we go through, I'll try and explain how I use this to change the way my life works. Um, for example, I probably get eight hours more a week of extra life than most people because I don't really commute. I live uh, less than a mile from where I work, where my, where my servers are. Um, and I go everywhere electronically. A uh, typical day for me, I'll wake up, I'll do a workshop in Asia, maybe three or four countries, then I'll go home and have breakfast. That's how I start my day. So it, it's a bit strange, but I'll try and shape, shape that, share that with you because I think um, one of the things I've learned is that you have to shape your life a little bit. Okay, so I want to start, if it's possible, just by sort of um, sharing with you one of my favorite um, diagrams. Sorry about that. One of my favorite diagrams. It's a, it's a rather strange one. Let's see if I can find it. There you go. Uh, I'll walk you through it and just see whether you recognize any of the elements. It starts over here where it says I have a high, high workload. Obviously not you guys, you have nothing to do. Just partying around in uh, LSO. All the, okay. So because I have a high workload, I don't have time to plan, to do, or to be creative. Net result is because I haven't planned it, I don't know how to work, I'm committed to, and I've only done half. So that means I end up saying yes more than is realistic. Of course, pushing my workload up, giving me less time to plan or to do anything. So I come close to deadlines other people think are important. And because they're worried they'll miss their targets and their goals, guess what? They come and they interrupt me. So I spend a lot of my time restarting half time work, which pushes my workload up, giving me less time to plan or to do anything. So now they know I'm disorganized, and they throw lots of rubbish at me and send me text messages, and it goes round and round and round. Have you seen this happening to your colleagues at work? <laughs> important question. How could I know your lives before I met you? <laughs> What I'm trying to explain is that something has happened which is bigger than all of us, because you're smart people. You wouldn't live that life unless you had to. And so that's why I really want to start. And then I want to build from there, because I have a really peculiar view of the world. I have a feeling that most of us are spending most of our times doing things which seem to make sense to us, which seem the right way of doing things, and yet somehow we don't get to the outcomes we want. And the reason for that is because we respond to a world we recognize and understand, but which I think no longer exists. You see, for us, yep, we're all oldies. Anyone here younger than Google? Nope, you're oldies. My definition of oldie is somebody who's older than Google. Very simple, or being in, in work for less time than Facebook. That's our problem. Because what happens in a fast-changing complex world is it mismatches our value set. You see, we were brought up in a world where there were correct answers. So the bad kids at school used to practice something which was known as collaborative learning, or in the teacher's words, cheating. Your value set doesn't match the world you're in. The, world, the way the world works, if you want to keep up with it, you've got to connect, you've got to in, be interdependent. You have to understand that that's how it works. But as oldies, we go, no, we don't want to do that. I'll keep myself secret. I'll keep all my files with only my naming system, etc., etc. And that just pushes up our stress levels. Most of our behaviors are completely irrelevant to the modern world. So that's what I'm going to try and walk through and try and help you understand what you can change, how you change, because the causes are often somewhere else altogether. And this is a huge headache for us. The time I live and work, in. It's a weird town. It's called Beaconsfield. It has strange people in it. And they do this thing called time travel. It's amazing. They wake up in a house, 21st century house, with a good computer, internet, broadband connection, everything else like that. They wake up, they get dressed, and they drive into a city or a town for about an hour on a train to go to a place called an office. Have you heard of this thing before? They sit there in front of a computer, sending each other these amazing things called emails. Have you come across this before? Yeah, so the, yeah, it's an amazing invention, 20th century. It's like a letter, but not quite. So you email me electronically, I email him, CCing her, she bumps into him, she emails me, and then I email back. After about 40 of these emails, somebody realizes that many people are involved, so they say the magic words, we must have a meeting to discuss this. <laughs> Completely crazy. And then they do this sort of weird stuff all day, and then at the end of the day, they get back on the train or in the car to go back to the 21st century. But they're so bored that they buy these things called devices who are swooshing and sweeping, lovely things, they're shiny, you know? And they spend their time create either consuming content or connecting to people who they don't know, have never met, they call them friends. Bizarre! And then finally they get back to the 21st century and they think this is normal. <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this is because you cannot tackle well-being at work as a topic on its own. It is completely intricately caused by so many other things. You see, I started looking at how, how people deal with change, and what I discovered was in the old world, generally when you were going to do something, you know exactly what you were going to do and how you were going to do it. How does that make you feel emotionally? If you know the goal, you know the method, how do you feel? Cool, comfortable, great, okay. Is that how you feel with all your biggest challenges at the moment? Is that how you feel with all your biggest challenges at the moment? 
we were doing interaction, okay? <laughs> no, okay, great. So, some of you have tasks where you know what to do, but you have no clue how you're going to achieve them, yes? Feel challenged. Some of you have been told how to do something, but you have no clue whether it will be of any use to anyone. Feel embarrassed. Some of you have been told something must be done. It should have been done yesterday. <laughs> we don't know what it is. We don't know how to do it, but you should have delivered it anyway. You got that. That just makes you feel really embarrassed, unprofessional. There are three different types of change. Now, as oldies, we always imagine the change is going to be of the first time. We call that painting by numbers. So we bring out our behavior for painting by numbers, trying to tell people what to do, and we get it all wrong. Look, if you are in a situation where you don't know what and you don't know how, how do you connect with people? How do you get people to follow you? Can you do it by telling them, or are you going to have to have a conversation and listen to them? Can you, will people follow you through, I call this the fog, when they don't trust you? Of course not. So as leaders trying to drive well-being, we have to build that, in, that connection, that engagement. The first speaker was talking about saying hello to everyone. That's part of that process of building that connection. I'm going to try and wrap up with a couple of things for you to think really hard about. The first is, you need to look at the bigger picture to understand how it all fits together. Don't just go at whatever's there. The second is, most of what you're doing is probably pointless. By stopping it, you will free up the time and take the stress off yourself in order to be able to function differently. And the third one is look for ways of connecting with human beings as human beings. Emotions, love, that sort of thing. Not just through targets and all that crazy stuff we try to get people to work to. And then when they're miserable, we go, ooh, well-being's well -being, well down. I use a, a little acronym. It's called BEAT, Behavior, Emotion, Actions, and Thinking. And that's what's in that book there. I watch out for time stealers. Time stealers are the real killers. As long as you have no time, remember that first diagram, you can't think, you can't do anything. Watch out for your own time stealers. You know, plan tomorrow today. Don't try and plan it in the morning, because you'll be too stressed. you run around doing all the pointless things, just responding to emails, not sure which ones are important. The really key one which I want to pick up on is the technology piece. You have to use technology to help you, not to slow you down. For example, you think of 400 words a, a minute, yeah? You may type at about 100 words per minute, but you text at 40. Is it really effective and efficient for you to be texting stuff? That's one. The second is try and break those habits. I know people, I, I was there myself, who are completely addicted to timelines and Facebooks and checking their emails. Most people take their phones to bed with them. The first thing they look at in the morning is not their partner, but their phone. They are crazy. You know what I mean? If that's you, you've got to break the habit. Call Turkey, lock the machine away for a month. Don't touch it, come back to it as a human being. You've got to break the habits. I work lots of tech companies, I work with Google, lots of companies. They spend Billions trying to make you buy these devices, to make you addicted. They actually have research on how to get addictive behavior on their platforms. Basically, there are billions, I think it's a, just under a trillion is spent globally around the world on marketing to make you miserable. It's called lifestyle marketing. You've seen all the adverts. There's somebody who's really miserable, I'm not very happy, and then they get a product, and then suddenly they're dancing, and that's what I was showing over there. And then, of course, because we're so monkey men, one sees, one does, so we see the funny headsets, and we all go and buy the white headsets. And we don't understand that we've been caught up in a little bit of madness. So first thing is look at your behaviors, and try and figure out what you're doing which doesn't make any sense. The second one is about managing your emotion. You see, there's so much out there, and your heart is really under pressure from all these things. Tricks I use, I do something called future dreaming. Every day when I'm uh, walking up, walking or running or going to the office, I think about all the things which could go wrong in the morning. Because when I've thought them through, when they happen, I don't get that crocodile brain of emotional response. I go, ha, I knew that was going to happen. You know what I mean? It's a positive. I feel proud that I dreamt it up in advance. And it calms me down. Also, positive self-talk is very important. You know, if you spend all the time thinking, oh, I'll never work, this is horrible, I don't like working here, it'll drop your spirits. Only I had somebody say something about, um, uh, we're not appreciated. I can't remember what the wording was about, something about being appreciated in the NHS. Don't look for appreciation. If your happiness depends on what somebody else thinks, you're in trouble. That's Richard Bach. It's very, very true. It has to come from your own purpose, what you're trying to do. The third area is actions. What on earth do you do in the day? I've already taken the piss out of you about your day. How do you design that? My day is very, very simple, as I started to describe it. I use technology to help me. All I ever do is break technology and use it. I don't use it in the same way as anyone else because my game is to help myself. And the, the final one is thinking. Always think twice and act once. You know, don't follow what other people say. If it hasn't worked, have a look at it, another look at it. Try to be creative and to bring people along with you, which is one of the things you wanted to understand and deal with ambiguity. Let them be part of the conversation. Have you noticed how many questions I've used in the past 30 minutes? Why? Because questions hit you higher up in your brain. Whether you like it or not, somebody asks you a question, you think about it, you fall in love with your own ideas. Have you noticed how brilliant your own ideas are? 
So that's the way you bring people in and get engagement. You don't just shout things at them. I also have a secret weapon. There's a chap called Tim Bean. Uh, I was always pretty fit before meeting this chap, but I have a secret weapon. It's, he's a longevity expert. His name's Tim Bean. And what he does is he looks at my whole world. So he tells me I'm allowed to eat. I wasn't allowed to eat anything over lunch except an olive. I'm sorry about that. But the mix is all wrong. Nutritionally, it doesn't work. You're going to sit down and you're eating starch. It's, it's going to be bad. You're going to put on fat. It's going to be where all the chemicals from the, the, the pesticides from the, the plants go and sit. And then it's going to give you cancer. It's not a good plan. You with me? Uh, but you're going to eat those sandwiches, chill a bit, and then go for a run. That makes sense. You'll burn the calories. So this chapter is quite useful. It also tells you a lot about how to exercise. So find people like that to help your organizations. So if you can help people around you to think about that, and you can help them to connect emotionally, maybe they'll all end up, without those horrible targets, having a great day at work. Thank you very much. Thank you.